Okay. Okay. Uh, this is the Town Services and Outreach Committee meeting. It's April 7th, 2022, and it's 633. Uh, um, it's a virtual meeting pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom <clears throat> or by telephone. Uh, see instructions below. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. So <clears throat> I'm called the meeting to order and I will uh, check to see if everybody on the committee can see and can hear. Um, Shalini Balmilne. I'm present. That's good. Anna Devlin Gauthier. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Dorothy Pam, yes. And Andy Steinberg. Present. Good, okay. <clears throat> Um, we're going to, um, the first item on our agenda was the outreach update from the community participation officers. And since one of them was feeling ill, that has been moved to the next, our next meeting, which is the 21st of April. So we're going to start now with no, item number B, uh, referred from the town council proposed revision of fees under general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property. Um, now, um, I know that Mandy Jo Haneke and um, Jennifer Taub and um, Michelle Miller cannot come tonight. So it is possible that Pam Rooney will be able to come. She wasn't sure if she could or not. Pam is in the audience. Oh, okay. So could Pam be promoted to um, into the meeting, Athena, please? Let me take a look. I haven't looked at the audience. Okay, let me just see. Okay. Dorothy, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so for the audience who's here who may have questions on the different topics, can we just share at what point people can uh, mm. make pop public comment? Well, we have public comment listed rather deep into the meeting. Um, we could uh, move it up. Um, because we were going to have public comment after we discussed the rental um, bylaw and the water and sewer. So do you think that we should move the um, public comment up earlier? So I, I know <clears throat> I, I get confused with public comment. Mm -hmm. We're not to engage with people when they make the public mm -hmm. comment. So um, sometimes it's used, it's, it comes after we've discussed it. But sometimes it's at the beginning of the meeting, and I really don't understand why one is better or worse than the other. So I'm going to ask Paul if he has a suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that um, so the council does it at the beginning of the meeting. It's just for you to listen to. Um, I don't think you have you're scheduled to make any decisions tonight. Um, you, you, it's more for and continuing to do information gathering. Um, so you you could do it earlier than later. It's just totally up to the committee's decision. And there have been times when public comment says, you may talk about anything that's not on the agenda. And again, I don't really mm -hmm. understand that point either. Um, I would assume our public comment could be on whatever people wanted to talk on the agenda or not on the agenda. But what are your thoughts on that, Paul? Yeah, and Athena can weigh on this on this as well. So the so the public can say what they want. It's and that's why this. But the the count the committee can't okay. respond because it's mm -hmm. not on your agenda. So otherwise, you're engaging in a conversation of a topic that wasn't publicly posted. Right. But okay. but public comment is a a um, posted agenda item. So listening is fine. Mm -hmm. So can, can I just propose that we move it yes. up front because yeah. And okay. Um, is that okay with everybody? Okay. Do we, we need a formal vote or can we just do sense of the meeting? Anyone with an objection to moving it up front? Okay. So then why don't we do public comment now um, so that people don't have, because we're going to spend a good deal of time on these two major items. Okay. Um, all right. So um, 
If anyone in the public would like to make a comment, uh, would you please raise your hand? Okay, I see Rosemary Koffler. Okay, um, can you um, connect us with Rosemary, Athena, please? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Well, you know my name. I live in Amherst at 16 McIntosh Drive, and I'd like to comment on something that is not on the agenda. I represent myself and other members of the Friends of the Amherst Senior Center. On April 4th, all members of the town council received my letter or our letter stating the issue of inadequate space at the Senior Center. We are unable to reopen fully to all the services, classes and programs that we once offered prior to COVID due to the lack of classroom space. A room once used, for example, regularly for dance and exercise classes, often attended by 20 to 30 people, is no longer available to seniors. The most desirable classroom in the building is closed to seniors on Thursday afternoons for the vaccine clinic. And the Musanti Health Clinic is requesting use of the room where health services such as blood pressures, foot care, and ear irrigations are expected to be carried out. Mindy Dom has earmarked money for exercise equipment for the senior center, but there is no place to create a dedicated exercise room for that equipment. The senior center is a vital resource and even a home, second home to many elders who live alone who need services and crave social contact. That need is even greater now after two years of isolation due to COVID. Yet the staff is challenged as to where to put the services and programs needed for those elders. The space is really only the tip of the iceberg. I encourage you all to look carefully at the statistics in the chart that you received along with the letter of April 4th which compares the Amherst Senior Center to other centers in the area. Not only is Amherst lacking in space, but it lacks adequate staff to serve the 5,200 seniors over the age of 60 in town. And it lacks the budget resources necessary for programming and supplies. Many seniors support initiatives by the town to enhance the well being of the community and they are proud to call Amherst home. However, there are many people concerned with the state of senior services. One comment on the age and dementia friendly survey underscores the lack of equity older folk adults are facing. And I'll quote that comment. The current senior center in Bangs is unappealing and programs are limited. The resources in Amherst are clearly not towards senior needs, but lavish outlays to the library, schools, et cetera. Amherst has shown no interest in needs of older residents. And that's only one of numerous similar type comments. I hope this issue can be put on the agenda for the next TSO meeting for discussion. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Rosemary. We will discuss that when we come to that near the end of our agenda. Um, I see that Elsie Fetterman has her hand raised. Um, could we see have, bring Elsie into the meeting, please? Thank you very much. And I'm very grateful that uh, Shalini had just sent me an email telling me about the meeting. I found out about five minutes ago and I'm very grateful to letting me know. And I think what we, that um, I wanna talk about the water and sewer uh, policies that the council is uh, in the process of discussing and it's on its way that it's gonna be very cohesive and everybody's gonna know it's gonna be in writing. It's gonna be wonderful. I don't know how wonderful, but I wanna make the public comment that I think the way you have open discussions about the school, about solar panels, I think this should be public 
participation because people, they're so aware of a school, especially if you have a child in the school, well, you, you're very concerned. But, you know, we take the water and sewer for granted. You know, I'm going to be 95 in June. And I always took water and sewer for granted. You know, I pay property taxes for 44 years, and that's what I have. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's a, a break in uh, the water main, and it happens to be on the street. And the cost was $18,800. And I don't know if this, I took out a home equity loan to pay the bill. And the five surrounding communities pay for breaks in the water main from the break to the meter. As I understand the recommended or proposed guidelines right now for this is that uh, the consumer, the property owner, would pay on their property and the town would take care on their property. I, uh, that would have helped me considerably since that I have no control of uh, what happens on the street. I mean, they have trucks or they have delivery, they have, uh, they empty the, gar the garbage trucks and the weather, the road. And to ask anyone you know, um, to pay for something in the road just because they happened to, I didn't even know I was connected there. But what I am asking now, since you're outreaching, I'm uh, very, very grateful, Shalini, that you told me that there is an outreach. I don't know enough about all the different committees, but I think the way you have open discussions about uh, should we build a school or a library about the fire department? I think the public, they are, there's no, there's not a, a consciousness or an awareness. I mean, when I first talked to Lynn about the problem, she said, not that she didn't care about it, but why would she even, even know about it? She has a well. I mean, she's not on city water. And so to have this, uh, burden on someone, and especially after I heard Rosemary about uh, seniors in the community and elders, um, that I would like, and I think, Paul, I think um, uh, she sent uh, some information to you, Lynn sent information, but I think that the way we have an open forum, we talk about solo, we talk about, you know, lots of everything, the only thing silent in H in Amherst is the age, you know, that to have people uh, give them an opportunity to be aware. Are you aware that you are on city water? And if you have a problem, even if it's not on your property, the way it stands right now, the way it stands right now, uh, you have to pay for it, even though it's not on your property. And I check with my insurance company and I, there's no way. And so what I'm really begging all of you, uh, and especially Paul, is the publicity is this it can be a real financial problem for mm -hmm. any. I mean, right. We don't have any, you know, that wealthy people to be able to handle a, a sudden bill of $18,800. So I think that um, before we ad actually adopt, formally adopt the policy, and I'm glad that we're, that everybody's working on it, that I think the public needs to be informed, mm -hmm. need to be told, you know, don't take it for granted. You know, you have a responsibility here. And that's yeah. all I'm asking you. And I am very appreciative, Shalini, that you told me having a meeting at 6.30 tonight. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking and seeing no other hands. So I think we can close uh, public comment and um, we will not, I gather, be able to discuss this, although Paul might be able to say something should he choose to um, before we go started, but no, he, not at this moment. Okay, so we are aware of the problem. Okay, I, I have to really tell you, we are aware of the problem and that attention is being paid, okay? So, um, in terms of um, the rental registration, 
Um, I, I, I had a clarification given to me that made some of the documents that I've received recently make more sense. And I, I'm gonna put, tell you what it is. Ah, Pam, I'm so glad you're here, Pam Rooney, um, to see if it is correct. Okay, the committee that is working on the new uh, rental registration bylaw is not asking us to vote on the bylaw at this moment. They're still, they have a lot of work to do on it. What we have been asked to consider is a kind of interim fee increase, which um, the building commissioner feels would be very helpful and useful at this time while we're waiting for the longer, more formal process of the bylaw to be completed. So first, um, Pam Rooney, is that correct? Is my interpretation correct? That is correct. Um, okay. This this is, I, and I can give a little background if you want, but, yes, but please do. Dorothy's, Dorothy's statement is absolutely correct. Um, the four sponsors of this rental update um, met with Commissioner Mora to discuss the current system and, and the application and the updates that, that might be possible. Our conclusion with that meeting is that it was, it was important to um, start the process now before we actually have the time to go through the entire bylaw, which will be fairly complex and fairly involved. Um, so similar to the, the parking fees that you dealt with not long ago um, that haven't changed in a really long time, uh, mm -hmm. the rental permit fee was discussed with Commissioner Mora and we felt that it needed some adjustments. It um, is a very basic rate and it is, it is any property owner that has a, that has a rental unit or units. Um, what we felt and Rob actually encouraged us to consider getting something in place prior to July 1, which is the beginning of the next fiscal year. Uh, we were very sure that it would take us much longer than July 1 to develop any kind of bylaw and get the input needed um, to craft that before July 1. But this is a first step that says um, we understand that we need to start some updates. Let's get something in place before the start of the fiscal year that, uh, that we can build on. It is a placeholder. Um, that's, that's essentially it in a nutshell. Okay. So some of the discussions that people have been having um, and that we had at our last meeting were to do with really, I think more the, the permanent bylaw, which is in the process, to do with trying to adjust fees in a way that would be equitable um, mm -hmm. to all times, uh, all different situations. So um, now that I have this understanding, because I mean, th there's a lot to think about and to talk about in terms of the bylaw. And I'm sure that the council will have further discussions on that. But so right now we are asked to, um, let's see what I have here, um, do something very simple. I'm trying to find out where I wrote it down. Um, I'm not finding it handy. Um, do you have it? Do you have it in front of you, Pam, while I'm, while I'm looking for it? I do not. I do not. Okay. Uh, I, I do. Oh, okay. Yeah. And yeah, um, and Shalini has a hand up, so if she wants right. to. Okay, Shalini, please do. I, I I found it, but Shalini, please present it. Yeah. Um. So what there, uh, what is being asked for is to increase the overall fee for obtaining a rental permit to two fifty dollars, and pro uh, provide an exception to the increase for those parcels where the property owner lives on site and owner occupied parcels would retain a $100 fee and then charge $150 per inspection required under the bylaw. This is the fee amount the Board of Licensed Commissioners had tentatively proposed for inspection fees. Right. Yeah. And the understanding is that the system as of now with our very short staff 
these inspections are upon complaint, the complaint driven. Mm -hmm. um, there's discussion, and again, I, I cannot predict what the group will present finally, that inspections might occur when the permit is taken out. Um, and there's discussions on having that one way to make variable fees make sense is to um, have the, 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 the inspection fee would be the one that would make it more equitable to have a larger charge for a, a unit, a, a property with more units, because just applying the, for the permit, um, it takes the same amount of time for two units as for 200 units, I guess. And we are under the, um, a stricture, I guess, that fees have a relationship to the work that is done. It can, they can't just be produced for social reasons, whatever. So um, I see three hands. Um, Shalini, I'll let you speak again, then Pam, and then Anna. Okay. Yeah. So given that we received a very um, detailed explanation of the impact, uh, this was a letter that all of us got from Darcy Diman about breaking down the impact that this uh, increase would have on residents versus uh, residential units on the smaller landlords versus the larger units uh, where the same parcel has 50 units, 150 units or 250 units and they're both being charged the same amount. And the idea was that um, even if we charged $1 per unit, which is not a big amount for renter uh, for larger landlord. And I know Doris, uh, um, Dorothy said that we're not allowed, uh, the, the town is not supposed to charge if it's not commensurate with the service. But I would argue that when there are 250 units, there is a higher exposure to more nuisance calls or other services that are required from the town. So it feels that we would be justified in charging additional amount. And then I just looked at one town city like Barnstable that does have a per unit and I could not see that they have an inspection requirement that it was tight and I may be wrong on that. Yeah. But I, I would definitely like a clarification. Like, is it a gray area here that we could charge like one dollar per unit, like leave it one fifty and do all of that, like between owner self, the owner occupied versus non, and then just say that it's one, like it's fifty or whatever, whatever you decide, mm -hmm. plus one dollar, you know, like twelve dollars per year or one dollar per okay. unit extra. All right. So um, I have an answer for that, but I'm going to call on Pam, and I see mm -hmm. Andy, your hand is up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I I would love to respond to that. Um, good points, and Darcy makes a good point. I think the four sponsors that put the that are starting to draw together information for the bylaw recognize that there are a number of issues that we want to address. One of them is that there's no clear enforcement mechanism there uh, for nuisances or for any anything else. There is insufficient staffing to make consistent inspections at this time. Um, the inspect what I would what I would point out is that we talk about inspection fees. Um, at this time, they don't charge anyone an inspection fee. They are inspections are complaint driven. So if if um, there is a nuisance or if there is if there is faulty wiring or something at a building, that I believe that those people are not charged today for the inspection done by the by the town staff. So we recognize that there are some inequities in the in the pricing of fees. Um, we one of the issues is that I'm, I'm looking at my list of issues. Um, the the inequity again between between one owner owner occupied unit and a Puffton Village, for instance, is is tremendous. I think the the table laid before you today, though, is simply on a basic fee structure that will take us through next year while yes. we get the bylaw in place and while we address those inequities because we are clearly aware that the inequities exist. So I, I, I hope that um, 
I mean, you may come up with a different fee structure, I, it, and that, that certainly is, is your prerogative um, to recommend something. I think what we are, um, the, the fee today is expected to be a permit processing fee. And so um, two units, you know, an owner with two units would pay a processing fee for their permit. Huffton Village would pay a processing fee for their one unit. I mean, for their one permit. Um, and so the, the, the dollars per service are in fact, with this proposal at least, equitable for the time being. Um, and I think that's, that's what I would encourage you to consider is that we, we are not able to solve all the problems right now, but we want to be able to um, start setting some different expectations for, um, for going forward. Thank you, um, Anna. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm having a little bit of deja vu because I did feel like in the last meeting we talked about this, we got pretty darn close to the end. Um, and so I wanna just make sure that I'm on the same page as everyone else. So I'm looking at the memo to town council with the revised fee structures. And what was proposed was for a parcel with a maximum of six units with one of the units owner occupied, it's $100 to register and obtain a permit. For all other parcels, it's 250. And I, I do wanna highlight what Pam said. It's like, we're going like, cart or like horse horse cart right like this is coming ahead of this huge revision it's not mm -hmm. a cart horse yeah whatever um and so this is coming ahead of this big revision after which it will make a lot of sense to revise these fees again um pam i believe that's what you were saying right is like this is this is a uh a, a thing to get us a little bit closer but until that bylaw is done and we cannot speculate about what that bylaw will contain mm -hmm. this is where we are and so for me, what was really helpful, and I believe Shalini, you had asked for this last time, was the rental fee comparison chart. And I think what was really helpful in it is there was not a lot of consistency, right? It was all over the board in terms of what people mm -hmm. are, are charging per unit. I do think that with our current structure, the services, the amount of time it takes town staff is pretty equitable for those large, large complexes versus a single house. And so it makes sense for, for the time being until the bylaw is changed, to keep the, the permit fees the same. I also just wanna note that if, unless I'm misremembering, um, I, someone said earlier, and I apologize if I didn't catch it, someone said earlier that, you know, if there are more calls to bigger apartment buildings, shouldn't it, shouldn't it cost more per inspection or, or because they're complaint driven? Yeah. But I'm recalling the um, right. building right. commissioner, building inspector saying actually more of the calls come from the smaller units, not mm -hmm. the, the larger. I remember that. Yeah, yeah so, so I think it's, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem keeping those consistent. Um, it's the same work to respond hypothetically, I believe. Um, and so, cause you're responding per unit, not per building, uh, could be wrong on that. But right now, because this is a temporary measure, I, I do believe that we should pass what was recommended to us. Um, if there are small changes based on the benchmarking data, that's fine. But I think that to spend so much time on this, knowing that the bylaw is going to change, I'm not mm -hmm. saying we shouldn't consider it and be very thoughtful. But I think we, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves in presuming what the bylaw is going to be before we know. Right. Thank you. And Andy, your hand is up. Yeah, I don't uh, I sort of agree that we should be careful not to get too far ahead. Uh, but there is some things that I think about, and I don't know if the Finance Committee is going to look at this a little bit too, though I think we're going to look at um, Finance Committee normally we'll look at things from a slightly different angle and they're both important because what I would like to do is to make sure that we have carefully looked at what is the cost of the current system since right now the fees are to support the system as it is in place, not as we might go. And that's the point that I think has just been made. And uh, is the increase necessary? Is it enough of an increase? What are we going to be able to do with the additional funds? And um, are we complying with the statutory requirements that the fees have to be commensurate with what is provided by the fees? It's not a uh, money, uh, it's, it's not a fundraising thing. 
-hmm. we don't charge fees to to raise to raise more funds than it costs to provide the service associated with the fees and that's uh, um, what are the legal requirements we have to be thinking about so these are issues that either the finance committee will look at or um, you know we're going to end up having to do it within this committee uh, mm -hmm. but in any event uh, where the um, we're really important as a TSO is to make sure that it makes sense um, as to how the fees are structured, both for fairness and uh, consistency. And I think that we'll uh, need to work, uh, make sure that uh, TSO is focusing on those kinds of questions. And I think that you know, there's just been some good discussion on that topic. Right, I, but before I call Shalini, I'd like to um, just mention that I believe that the increased fees in this interim motion would help the building department hire at least a part-time staffer to help them get ready for the changes of the overall overdone, of the, the new version of the bylaw. Because um, right now, it's, there's very little staff on that. Um, uh, am I correct on that, Paul? No, um, so so we don't have an additional staff person budgeted for this department, but there. So I think what the building commissioner is, is supporting this proposal because it's relatively simple. It's a, it's a modest increase for multiple units um, dwellings, and secondly, there's some time sensitivity to it because we start moving to, to, towards rental registration soon. So the council, if they're going to set the fee, if they're going to change the fees, they should do it sooner oh. than later. Uh, recognize, but he does recognize that the council is going to be digging deeper into re rental registration um, in, in the future. But, and so looking at this as a one year thing as the sponsors had proposed makes sense. Okay. And Shalini. Oh, oh, Andy, did Hi. you have a follow up that you no. needed to say right there? No. Okay. Uh, Shalini. Pam has a hand up if she wants to respond to something. Okay. Pam, would you like to speak? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Um, I was just going to respond to Andy in that, um, actually to all of you, that as the bylaw develops, you're going to be a pretty key part of getting feedback to the bylaw construction in that you are going to be looking at fees. And so I think as you consider, um, I, there are several questions that were posed in the memo to all town councilors. Um, before the work session last last week. And there are a number of things that, that really are talking about fee structure, equity, and how they're applied and how they are um, measured. And so I would I would really, you know, hope that this committee would take that on and and really, you know, work through it um, for feedback at the at the at a later point as we get there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Shalini. So um, what I see as town services and outreach uh, job right now is to just look at the rent, residential rental registration fee. We're not considering the bylaw. The bylaw, when it happens, it happens. And that's, so right now we're just talking about the fee. And to me, the structure that's being provided does not feel equitable. We are putting more burden on, and on the small landowners, and as far as and I feel we're justified again going back to the point that we are making ourselves more vulnerable to more nuisance calls. And even though we heard, I believe Rob Mara is saying that we get more calls from um, single family or the homes, but in other complexes, the report that. Uh, Darcy's email person shared with us said that five complaints came from complexes, one from a business and only one from a family. In the previous report, nine co uh, complaints came from complexes and one at a, from a single family home. So, I mean, with that, all I'm saying is without having an accurate research done into where what is happening, it's only speculation where the problem is coming. And we can only say hypothetically that if we are giving a res if we are giving a permit to 250 units versus one unit as a town we are 
uh, increasing the probability of there being problems in 250 units versus a single family home. Just the probability increases. When you have 250 units, there are more chances of something going wrong there versus just the numbers, the probabilities, right? I feel that justifies and allows us to be more equitable towards small family homeowners by charging something, a fee structure, which already exists. I'm not creating something new. This already exists in other towns like Barnstable, which have, um, there's a fee of $90 and $25 for each additional unit on the same parcel. So why can't we do something similar? So that way the smaller homeowners, if they have just three units, they will be paying 90 plus 75 versus someone who's paying 250, has 250 units is paying 90 plus 25 times 250. Shalini, I just want to interject. The, the problem here is the relation of the fee. Under the by, new bylaw, it's quite likely that because if you have a big building with many units, that they'll, you'll have many inspections and they yeah, will have to pay more for the inspections, but we're not providing- I know, I know, I understand. I, okay. So I already the, understand that, and I am okay. not talking about the inspection. No, but part. I'm talking I'm about the ability to hide, to change the fee. But um, I was asked to make a plan of time, and um, I had to, in a previous discussion, mm -hmm. and I, I thought maybe we would have till seven fifteen on this, sure. and it's seven after seven. Now we don't have to stick to that absolutely rigidly, but we have to kind of stick to something like that. So um, we have yeah. to. Do we have, do we, Paul, do we have to do a vote today on this? He does, he does want to vote because he wants the vote before July. So can it be on our, our meeting, the next meeting, or does it have to be today? It, it can be at your next meeting because the council doesn't meet until the 25th and your next meeting is the 21st. Okay. All right. All right. So we'll have to, at some point, um, come to terms with that. We've received um, a, a, a number of points of view. Um, I'll call on Anna again, and we'll see where we can get with this. But um, remember, this is just a temporary thing that we're doing. The, the issues that you raised, Shalini, I totally agree with you, okay? They will be dealt with in the bylaw. But um, uh, Anna, did you, you had your hand up. It looks like Shalini would like to say something. Oh, Shalini, do you have something else to say? There? Yeah, I was going to just respond that that I'm not talking about the inspection fee. I am talking about registration fee. And my question maybe for next week is, can we look into Barnstable, which is also Massachusetts within Matt, and how are they able to charge per unit for the registration? This is not for the inspection fee. I am not talking about inspection. I'm saying the rental registration is um, based on units. And I may be wrong, but can someone look into it and get back to us? Because if there is a way that even in the interim, we can propose something that gets, that is more equitable and gets us the funding um, mm -hmm. and it's allowed, why okay. would we not move in that direction? Okay, thank you. And, and yeah. Anna. Um, so two things, Shalini, could you clarify what question you'd like answered about Barnstable? Because I mean, if it's something that we can do without bothering, like without, not bothering, but without taking up staff time on this additional staff time, just because like, I mean, I'm assuming town staff made us this really nice table um, that was in our, our, uh, our packet this week. So it might be really helpful if you could very clearly articulate what research question you're asking them to look up. Um, the other, do you want okay. me to email that or say it now? I mean, I'm not going to research it, but if you know it now, maybe that, that would be helpful. Yeah. So the question is, can we charge a residential uh, registration fee per unit in Amherst? Like the way, well, we can, like the way Barnstable is doing. So, but there's, so we, we can, and that's shown on a lot of the other towns on this table. No, I'm being told we can't do that because it's not commensurate with the service uh, difference in so the inspection. Okay, so so that's the point I agree with, right? Like at this point, I do not think that it's uh, it's fair for us to charge more for more units when it takes the same amount of work. If it gets to a point where we're doing something different to register mm -hmm. them, then it would make sense to me. But I I see it as like a, a weird punitive measure 
um, against larger buildings when mm -hmm. it's just filing the same form for one unit versus six, right? So for me, that's the sticky point in doing that right now before the bylaw has mm -hmm. changed. Right, if it's um, not tied to inspection. If it's not tied to inspection. Right. I also do, the other thing, the reason I initially raised my hand is I, I do take issue with the, um, I don't think that it's a direct correlation between um, just number of people and number of incidents, right? I think that there's so many factors that come into play around um, complaints that there's a reason why our building inspector, and I, I trust them when they say like that they have fewer calls from these larger complexes um, because of the design of it, right? Like there's just different ways of, of existing that facilitate different things that might cause complaints. And so for me, that's the other issues. I, I just, I want us to be very careful. And, and that's speculation too. Um, I want us to be very careful about uh, what we're what we're claiming without having done our own research and i think that there's also a point where we should be doing that research right that that data is accessible um and so yeah and i i do trust the building inspector on that so my 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 take on this because i know we are two minutes away from our time limit and dorothy i appreciate you setting time limits um is that for right now for setting this for the next year ish um it makes sense given that we spend the same amount of staff time and effort for a unit with one apartment than a unit with 30, it makes sense to retain the same fee as that procedure shifts. And in my mind, it improves based on the hard work of Pam and Jennifer and Michelle, et cetera, then it would make sense to reflect those changes in the fee structure. Okay. And Pam Rooney, could you speak, please? Sure. Just a, a last thought. Thank you. Um, I would agree. I would agree with what Anna just said. I think the one differentiation that we wanted to make was between owner occupant or owner occupied units and, and non owner occupied units. So the, the differential in the fee, yes, they are, I, I misspoke earlier. Yes, they're all getting the same service, um, but the 250 would be for non owner occupied. The $100 would be for owner occupied. And we felt that, that we really also need to start the equity process of and the encouragement of people to be owner occupied. So that's all, I, and I appreciate you all thinking about this. And um, thank you for inviting me. Okay, thank you, um, Shalini. Um, yeah, Anika has a hand. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Anika. Please. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I as well, you know, thank the creators of this. Uh, uh, ongoing will, will be a bylaw for their work. Um, and I would also like to ask that in addition to while we are talking and contemplating that we could maybe consider um, homeowners who live in Amherst and who rent out homes uh, to um, occupants that where there has been no complaint. Because while we're talking and discussing, you know, these rent, these fees will probably be passed over to those renters who are in many <clears throat> cases paying more than uh, most homeowners are for mortgage. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of people coming from COVID recovery. So um, I think that it would be nice if there was some consideration of, as well as um, home, like owner, uh, owners who rent out their home in Amherst and who live in Amherst and who have had no complaint whatsoever and are already, um, you know, have tenants who either, you know, for themselves, and it's not really for us to determine what is high rent um, or someone's situation. And I say this in recognizing that the fee increases and where they are, are modest, you know, and I know that, um, you know, this wasn't the intention to, you know, uh, mm -hmm. raised rents and fees on people, but just that e even though this these are modest increases, considering that we also consider just the trickle down effect on people as well. So one of the considerations, Anna, that I have seen that would address the uh, landlords you're speaking about is that landlords whose properties have had no complaints, uh, that they the, the inspection schedule, which we don't have, OK, but when we have an inspection schedule, uh, some of the considerations are that properties that that have no complaints need to be inspected less often and thus they will pay less money through the long run. Um, I mean, that is one way that you can you can deal with the pre people that manage very good property, but don't happen to be owner occupants. 
Um, Shalini, this will be our last word on the topic for this week, this meeting. So it is the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate Anika's um, comment because I think it's just showing that there are nuances to this very simple issue before us. It's, it seems simple, but there are nuances and the trickle down impacts. And I would just urge us to look at it in a way that what is it projecting to the people? And what I'm getting a sense from the emails is that mm -hmm. people are not feeling it's equitable towards the la small landowners. And last thing, if it was simply based on the effort being used, firstly, we don't know all the nuances of how the effort shifts between, you know, what all goes into it. I don't know what the impact of it is, so I'm not saying I do know, but uh, I've lost my thought, so I'm going to let it go, mm -hmm. but I just urge us to look at what can we do that will um, be equitable and it's possible mm -hmm. to, um, yeah, okay, never mind, okay. I don't know what that thought was. Well, Shalini, I think that we share your goal that we do want things to be equitable. We also, um, at least speaking personally, I want to do what the building department wants to do some raising of fees to help bring in some very needed money to that department on this interim bill. And we hope that we can really have a really great discussion on the new bylaw when the committee is finished putting it together. And I think we will have, I think we'll have a lot of discussion on that because there's going to be many, many aspects to it and we will all bring uh, our best minds to it. Um, Okay, so now we're going to go into the discussion of water and sewer. And Anna has agreed to be the lead person on this issue. Um, and uh, I thank you, Anna, and I turn it over to you and to Guilford and to Amy. Thank you. Yeah, so thrilling stuff. I had a jump at the chance. Um, so I'm going to start off with Paul and Guilford and Amy. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, Guilford and Amy. Paul, we're glad you're here too, but Guilford and Amy, you're not normally here. So welcome. Um, and if you would like to, uh, to kick us off with an overview, my plan for today is um, I'd love for us to get at least through water, um, if not start on sewer, but I'd love for us to, to get all the way through water. And um, my thought is to go section by section, which I know everyone's excited about, and uh, see if folks have questions in each area, as well as give a quick, for each area, give a quick overview of kind of what's in that, um, what's, what's contained in that uh, section. Does that sound okay to you? Um, good evening. Thanks for having us. Uh, we were actually we were kind of told to lay out some decision points. And as we were trying to play with decision points, there is only, there's one key decision point that has to be made for water and sewer. And if you don't mind, that might be the place to start. And then we can go from there. Sure, that sounds good. Okay, great. Um, so I can actually, I'll, I'll share a little slide we have, we made up and hopefully that can, Spur some conversation. Um, mm. well, I gotta find it now. Uh, So, uh, can everybody see the a little PowerPoint mm -hmm. thingy? Yep, yep. Sorry, PowerPoint slide uh, thing. Key. Um, so, really, we're down to, and people keep talking about it. And even the person who wanted to talk, who talked this uh, this evening, um, who owns the service line? Um, the way the regulations you have presented to you for both the water and the sewer, they're written. Is, as they've been written in the past and as we've operated the system since the town took over in the mid 40s. Um, the, the property owner owns the service line all the way from the main to the house and is responsible for it. So if, if you do not agree with that, then 
the two cho other choices are is that we own the main from the service from the main to the property line, or we own the service from the main all the way to the house. Um, there's lots of different um, issues with that. Um, if we own to the property line of the of the town layout. It's usually only at the most it'll be 50, maybe 100 feet that we own, depending on where the water line is and the layout. If you say we're going to own the entire service line, the question then comes down to a couple of things. Do we own, uh, if a house is set 500 feet or a quarter mile back from the road, is the town responsible for that whole length? Is the town responsible for repairing that whole thing? Is the town responsible for any landscaping that might be in that area? Um, is the town responsible for, and you guys were just talking about this, is rental properties. Is, is it the same requirement for rental properties, large ones and small ones? Is it the same re requirement for our institutions? Um, so these are the, this is the, this is the principal and biggest question to, to wrestle with right now is how do you want to, who's going to have ownership? Do we keep the old way? Or do we go to a, one of the two newer two newer type of methods? And I'll just stop there and let you ask some questions and we can go from there. Okay. All right, so questions on this one, Dorothy. Um, ownership is one thing. Uh, there's an intermediate thing, which is for the town to sell insurance to the homeowner for the part of the line which is on their property. Because uh, you have laid this out really well and it's easy to see that it's, it's the, the majority of houses in some blo blocks are going to be very short amount of line that, that that's to the house but there are other places where this could be a very long line and that's part of it the decision of the homeowner or the home builder where to build the house so if there were offered a private insurance then such issues as length and distance would would be related to uh, the fee of the insurance. So that's, I'm just putting that out there for consideration. Thank you. Uh, Shalini? Paul has his hand up. Oh, uh, Paul, sorry, you were first, I wasn't sure if you wanted to. Paul, yeah. Just, just to address that point, and um, we are meeting with a company that provides that kind of insurance, Dorothy, at I think at the end of the month, in a couple of weeks, I'm not sure exactly the date, but they will be making a presentation and we'll understand more of the finances of how that would work. That would be private insurance that the homeowner could purchase at their discretion. It would not be something that the town would provide necessarily. But what we had heard from um, one resident was that I want to buy it, but I don't, my insurance company doesn't offer it. So is there a way the town can open the door to let me buy it when I want to buy it? So that's what we're looking into. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did you have your hand up? Who did you say? I said Andy. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure if Andy, I, sorry, this sounds okay. similar. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I didn't hear who you were uh, referring to either, but thank you. Um, the Finance Committee is going to be talking about this issue too when we have our meeting next uh, week from, well, Tuesday of next week. And uh, I think that we need to just be in regular communication between the two committees in some way beyond the fact that I'm the one member who's actually on both committees. I think that um, we're looking at, you know, we've, we've thought just in sort of informal questions being posed by individual members, kind of the same issues that have just all been brought forward. But obviously, what we also want to think about is getting some actual data on the number um, of incidents that have happened and what would be the effect on um, rates. Because in the end, we have to remember that if the town is going to take over, it's really the enterprise fund that's going to be taking over um, the liability. and the um, charges get spread over all of the rate payers because it's gonna get paid for someplace. And um, that's how it's going to occur. 
And uh, so we really want to try and do the best we can to understand if we make this shift, um, what is going to be the effect of um, on the rates of individual payers and uh, then you get into the other question of what's uh, happening with the institutional owners. Uh, our biggest customers um, uh, are the university and the colleges and how it's going, to, um, you know, how that factors into this whole thing. So um, it is a difficult but extremely important issue. And uh, I think we just need to do our best to try and understand all of those points and um, look at it both from a financial perspective, but ultimately, and this is where I think it gets back to TSO, um, is uh, what's a fairness issue. So. Thank you. Johnny? Um, so uh, in the, um, uh, the person who came today, she mentioned that there were five neighboring towns that um, bear the cost of repairing the water main. And so I can, and based on the presentation, the slide we just saw, I can see all the different complexities. And also I'm just wondering how other towns are handling those kind of complexities. And second question was, I think Guilford had mentioned betterments, and I don't know what those are in the uh, town council meeting, something related to betterments. And somehow that's related to this. I don't know if it is relevant to this conversation, if you could expand on that. And if it's not relevant, you know, you can skip it. Guilford? So for betterments right now, don't come into this situation. So I'll just leave it, say that and leave it out. Um, other communities, they do one of those three options. Um, Springfield goes all the way to the meter inside the house. So they're responsible from the service from inside the house to the main. Um, a lot of their houses are close together. They don't have very many houses that are far away. I don't really know how they handle the far away houses. Um, Northampton, Northampton had the same rule we had. Uh, I understand they were gone when I was there. Um, there was a change, but I understand they went back. So I'm not really sure. But um, there are communities in the Commonwealth and throughout the nation who have different mechanisms, and they're one of the three options. Um, so it's not like we're the only community that says we do it from the main, that you're responsible from the main to the house. Um, there's a mix and it's up to the community. They usually choose what they want to. I do have numbers for Andy, unless we want to take Annika's question. Um, Anika does have a question. My my question was numbers, so I I will hold my question. Um, Anika, what's what's yours, and then we'll get some numbers from Guilford. So I have a question. I just I want um, clarity. This may have been this may be obvious if it's across the board, um, but considering that UMass um, and the the colleges are our biggest um, customers. Now would, for instance, Mrs. Um, Ederman, who spoke earlier, would, um, Federman, excuse me, would they each have the same charge? Like if, if the same issue had happened to each, like would, would, you, would they each receive that same bill? They, they typically receive a larger bill. Um, so let me show you another picture here that we have to help understand what's going on. Um, share this one with you. I, I meant issue to issue if I wasn't clear. Yes. Okay. So, and th this is a, this is here is a drawing of uh, a map showing our water lines and you see there are different colors here. Mm -hmm. So everybody who has a purple water line, this is UMass right here. Mm -hmm. that, that's UMass's property. Um, this is UMass's property. They're responsible for their own water services as well. And they're also responsible for water mains that are off our water mains. So they have large 12 inch lines that run off through campus to make water system for them. So they run their own sort of 
internal private system, private distribution system in their campus. Um, this is Amherst College down here, this one right here, and this purple one down here. Or it's not really purple, is it? But I'll call it purple. It's purple. Um, that's Hampshire College. That's theirs. The green lines you see are actually private lines in apartment complexes or some type of housing subdivision that's not been accepted by the town. Um, Amherst Hills is over here. It's not fully accepted by the town, but it will be, and it will become blue at some point. Um, this is um, Hopbrook and Kestrel, I believe. That's a subdivision that's gonna become permanent in the town at some point. But these other ones are um, apartment complexes. This is the boulders and um, mm -hmm. all that, that area. Okay. This is the Applewood area where they have the assisted living and then the senior living. Mm -hmm. um, this is townhouses and uh, Puffton and presidential should be in here. This is presidential. Um, so those are the green lines. And so they would be responsible for everything that's theirs. So UMass now has the same rule that uh, common, the average owner and uh, property owner in Amherst has. They usually just have bigger lines. Thank Did that answer you. your question? Any good at that answer? Yes, thank you. Great. So, Gilford, I'd, I'd love to hear the numbers. I think for me, if I can use my, my little raise hand, um, I'm strongly in favor of having it be the utility's responsibility to the property line. Um, and what I would like to know is what are the implications on the on, on of cost, right, for um, for residents? Uh, and so I'm, I'm would love if you've got any sort of numbers that get close to that, uh, as well as the other options that I'm I'm less excited about, but would like to hear more of. Thank you. Okay, so we this this is um can you, you can see the slide here. It says service repairs from 2019 to present. Gilford, can you make that full the full screen? I can, but then I can't change pages. Okay, okay. Um, That's okay. All right, sorry. <laughs> uh, I guess there's there is a benefit to having Athena do these. <laughs> she can change pages. Um, so in three and since 2019, we've issued 36 permits for water and sewer. Um, this is kind of a breakdown. Um, and then the average cost to repair a sewer line has been about um, seventy-three hundred dollars and a water not, water line forty-nine hundred, and that's just in the layout. That's not beyond the layout, and this is just using our numbers that we use from Mass DOT to figure these things. So this is not a contractor's number; these are state bid numbers. Um, roughly, it works out to it's about for sewer. It's about two hundred and twenty dollars over these three years per foot a sewer line replaced and about $250 per foot for water line. Um, so that's kind of how it breaks down over those three years. Um, we kind of, if we, so that was, third, in three years we did 36, but if the town were to take responsibility for these sewer lines and for these water lines, we would want to be a little more proactive and wouldn't want to wait for them to break. We would choose the older ones and we would try to replace them uh, a certain number every year. So we kind of came up with the fact that we would try to shoot for 100 to 200 repairs a year. And that would mean an additional 7,300 to $1.4 million that we would spend based on these numbers to do it. Um, this doesn't really include um, police details, if we had to have a police detail, it doesn't include if we have to do any landscape repairs or if we are in an area with a lot of underground utilities, this is just a rough ballpark number. It's not very detailed. So this is kind of the numbers we threw together to answer the question, which actually came from the finance committee um, today. So does that kind of answer some of your questions? I'll stop for a second. It does. I, I have a couple more, but um, that's okay. Dorothy. Um, I've told this before, but when our sewer line uh, backed up and broke, um, it was about $30,000. It turned out to be a long way. The main wasn't till the corner of sunset. And we had to repair the line 
and then the sidewalk, and then the lawn that was all dug up. Now I had insurance. So I wasn't totally satisfied with the job that the our repair people did. We also had to repair some of our driveway, but I was satisfied with the job that the town did for which I wasn't charged, okay? Because they had to have um, inspections, they had to have police details, they, you know, a lot of stuff was done to allow this to happen on Amity, a very well-traveled street. Um, so, uh, you know, and how people choose to make their repairs is also up to them. We could have repaired our whole driveway, but we decided only to repair half of it. Um, it's an, it can be a very expensive process. And I, I personally am, would like to have town offered, perhaps subsidized insurance. So because the individual property owner may have different standards as to how they want things fixed, done or restored. And you know that's some of it that they would have to pay for the level that they want. Um, so I was just very happy that I had the insurance. I believe in it. And I know that uh, some people who have spoken to me about this have found that I got it when we bought the house, that when you already have the house, it's very difficult or impossible to get it when you, if you do it after the fact. So that's why I'm really supporting uh, the town finding out a lot more about offering insurance. So I think that would solve many of the problems. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh my question is, is a little bit of a follow-up. I think it sounds like, Dorothy, from what I understand, and I'm the first to admit that understanding insurance is not a strong point, uh, but there is, there's the op option for private insurance, and then there's the option of town, essentially the town is the policyholder, right? And so, uh, Paul, when you are looking into this, it would be really helpful to understand maybe the differences between those two and what the benefits of each would be, what the costs of each would be for the town. Um, that would then get passed over. So the, the thing about this, I'm looking at this slide, Guilford, and the thing is that residents don't really have the luxury to be proactive, right? And so uh, I, I appreciate that one of, in my mind, one of the pros of doing this is that we could be proactive in repairing, right? We could be actually on a schedule and not just responding to emergencies, which are more costly, tend to do more damage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that for me is, is a big, another big reason why moving to a system where the town owns, the town is responsible for up to the property line. I personally, and I'm open to hearing other committee members thoughts on this. For me, the idea of, of going to the water shut off is too, it, for me that there's too much at play that, that, that can come into that. But to the property line, um, to me again, in my, my mind feels rational. Um, the other question I have about this is you have dedicated construction crew and associated equipment, but we're now talking, as you say, 100 to 200 service lines that need to be repaired and replaced every year. We also, I'm sure, well, I'm sure you might know, but I'm sure that there are implications based on how old those water lines are, right? And so I think that there's continued questions around health and safety um, in terms of what those water lines contain. But I, I wanna know if you need more staff to do this. Is it realistic to say that you can do 100 to 200 lines? If this is the route we go and there's 20 ifs in that question, would you be able to actually start phasing this into the schedule? So that's a good question. <laughs> um, we, we were talking about it quite a bit um, today. And to, to do this many, we, we're not really staffed for it. So we would have to do some type of either add more staff or a hybrid where we have a staff person or two people who like manage the program and then contract the workout. But then contracting the workout, the prices would go up a little bit because we, our prices are lower usually. Um, the slide I just put up here is actually for water. So water has a little less cost and sewer has a cost, has a, the cost before, just so you know. Um, and this is all just within the right of way. And just a, a key, um, just a, a rule of thumb we use for every hundred thousand dollars we add to the budget in water or sewer, it's usually around ten cents that goes to the rate. Okay. So that one more that's time? just the All right. what? Could you repeat that? I didn't write it. So down. every hundred thousand dollars we add to the budget for water or sewer, it usually adds about ten cents to the rate. Gilford, can I just 
jump in or Anna, Anna can I just jump on it? Yeah, I'm so sorry, Amy. I had my Zoom screen small and you were off. I'm so sorry. Please. It's yeah. it's totally okay. Gil, Gilford's doing a great job presenting it. Like I like he said, he and I have been talking about this pretty extensively. Just the one thing that I wanted to point out, you know, to your point, Anna, about the um the age of some of these and everything is that's that's how we got from like that that look of okay for the past three years we've had 36 people pull permits so that looks like about 12 a year but people who own these houses they're only repairing them when they know that they're in rough shape but the reality is you know if you get a sewer blockage um, that backs up into your basement and the town's responsible you're going to want the town to fix that you're not going to be okay with them just clearing the blockage and not dealing with it um and you know Similarly, based on the age, you're going to want the town, you're, there's going to be expectations that the town repairs or replaces your service line before. Um, so looking, realistically, looking at the age of the service lines and the materials of our service lines, that's how we came up with the 100 to 200 per year that would need to be because there's a lot of them that are, you know, very old, um, you know, undesirable materials that we wouldn't want the liability of what could happen with those. So just wanted to comment on that. I have now moved my people over. So you are fully on my screen. Uh, Dorothy. I, I wanted to add that the advantage of the town insurance is that the town could advertise it with the bills. It could say this insurance is available. Most people don't know about it. Most people don't think of it and they're not aware of it. And that's why they don't have it. Okay. But the town, if the town owned it or wasn't, you know, the, the middleman in it, they would advertise it with the bills and people who are existing homeowners who cannot get it now without uh, in any way would be able to get that insurance. So I, I really think it's a really good way out of some of these difficult problems. Thank you. Anika? Okay, and uh, another question. So this sounds, I mean, this sounds like, okay, this is the way to move forward. But my question being is if, let's just say, if this was uh, voted in right now today, um, just so I understand clearly, the, the staff is not there to sustain these numbers, or am I wrong? Doesn't sound like they have the staff, from what I understand. Yeah, Amy, go ahead. It's either the staff isn't there or we'd have to compromise some other service to put the staff towards these efforts. So as a, as a follow-up, do you have kind of an estimate of, of with the staff that you have now, what would be a realistic number per year if it's not the one to 200? Um, with the staff now, we would probably barely eke out probably 25, I think probably a year. Okay. Nika, does that answer your question? It sure does. Thank you. Uh, just, just so you know, there's roughly 6,000 accounts in our system. Wow. Yeah, so is that is that on top of the emergency ones or is that, that's the, that's the number, whether it's emergency or repair, repairing proactively? Um, I'm thinking emergency. Well, Sorry, I, I don't mean like emergency, emergency. I mean, just like not planned. Well, if, if we're told we're responsible for these services, up to, even up to the property line, we would make a list and we would just start working on them. And if there was an emergency in the middle of that, we would have to stop and take care of it. Um, that's how it would work. Yeah. So, so my question piggybacks on Anika's, which is how... Do you see a way that this can be phased? Um, and that's, I know that's a really tough, tricky thing, but because we don't necessarily have the funds to hire the staff and do all the things right this second, and we can't necessarily, it's once again, we are at a cart and a horse, people. So, how do we, is it possible to phase this in? in any so, way? you have you have another issue going on, which is the labor force right now. Um, if you mm -hmm. told me to go hire the people right now, I probably could not do it. Yeah. Um, so we are guaranteed if you choose, if you choose that we're now responsible for any piece of the service, um, we would have to phase it in. And there would be a time period where there'd be some unhappy customers who, who wouldn't get their, 
who may not get the service they want right away because of that. And it may mean that we have to really, really rely on contractors to pull us through in the beginning as well. So I wanna be conscious of time. Um, and I know this is probably the one of the biggest decision points, but Gilbert and Amy, are there any other things that you would like to get to in terms of decision points? This, this, is, this is the biggest one. Side. I know, I know. I, I'm not cutting anyone off if folks have continued questions. I just don't want you to feel like you haven't gotten through your content. Mm -hmm. Dorothy, do you have an additional question on this? Yes. Um, Guilford, what is your recommendation? How do you think the best way would be for the town to go? Um, <sighs> my, I, I don't really, it, it's really a town decision. It's how the it's how the leadership of the town wishes to provide a service to your residents. Um, you, you wanna, we always strive, we strive to provide the best we can. And sometimes we make it, sometimes we're a little short. Um, we don't really ever fail, fail, we feel. Uh, some people may say that. Um, mm -hmm. Pothole season this year was pretty much a, a blowout. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> It's up to you. How, how do you, what, what level of service do you think you want to have as a community? Um, that's really what it is. I don't really have an opinion. I will make whatever, I will make it work however you choose to make it go. Um, and we'll strive to be 100% on top of it and make it come out the way we should come out. We just need to know which way you want to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Honey? Um. Oh, okay. So could we get, I'm trying to think of this not as an either or situation and like what are other possibilities A, to keep residents informed that, you know, that this is a possibility that can happen. And, you know, and, and so there's that educating a residents that we heard about today. The second thing I really like is the, what Dorothy Pam said about the insurance, we're thinking about insurance. What other ways, like, is there a way that the, that you all could be anticipating and um, and not like you, I think you brought that up, go for the not waiting for something to collapse, but anticipating and kind of doing the repairs on an ongoing basis. But can we look at other towns or other ideas that would minimize the impact or, you know, the shock of the sudden thing happening? How do we how do we improve and what are some ideas we can get? Um, so unfortunately, we have sent out multiple information about services and mostly we talk a lot about fats, oils and greases and not things you shouldn't flush down your toilets. Um, we've spent a pretty fair amount of money over the last few years sending information out about that. Um, we've had we have at least one area which has uh, been chronically a problem with fats, oils, and greases, and we've just sent we've sent tons and tons of letters and and information to them um, saying, "Hey, this is a problem in your area. Stop flushing these things down your toilets and stop pouring grease down your drains." Um, uh, there's been very little response to our effort, so. I could say that we would reach out and send out these general mailers, but these general mailers are um, not taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, we do, and we will be required to start talking to residents with water services that are certain ages. That's part of um, that's part of the updated lead and copper rule from D from EPA and DEP. Um, people with old water lines, we'll be talking to them pretty soon, and we'll be having a very pointed conversation with them that's going to be a little more than just a general mailer because we're required to by law. Um, but that's pretty much, that's kind of the only thing we can do. I mean, people, come on, water and sewer rules, it's just not that, it's not that flashy and uh, attractive. It's, uh, you'd rather watch Game of Thrones, right? Or something like that. What? Different kind of Game of Thrones, Gilford. Um, the, so I'm so, I'm so sorry, everybody. Uh, and, <laughs> I look forward to you all talking to me because my water line is pretty sure old. Anika. 
Yeah, so I very I vividly remember our presentation on Monday uh, with the wet wipes and the grease and um, that. And um, so whereas I, you know, would um, think we would want the the best service possible uh, for for residents and also really, you know, I guess trying to uh, help uh, help with you know educating people or just asking people to be mindful, just to um, round it up, out because <laughs> you know, we are the experts. Um, I'm far from a, a, a sewer expert aside. Why don't you do my part to help out here? So I wonder if we could round out with with Amy. Do you have an, an opinion on what you would recommend if if you had to make a call right now? Like what I recommend you guys do about this decision of ownership? Yes. Um, I mean, I think Guilford said it well. Ultimately, you guys have to decide which way you want to go. Um, I mean, the only thing that I would caution is just, you know, different decisions have different price points. And so, you know, it's you, you make a decision, but the decision comes with a cost. Um, and so as long as you're weighing that out, ultimately, you know, we, we leave that into your hands, you know, we're, we're happy to do whatever you guys have to wrestle with these big decisions. Thank you. I was, I was saying to, to pass it up, we're just valuing your opinion. You all are, are there on the ground and, and seeing a lot more uh, than we are with a, a lot more expertise. So thank you for weighing in. Thank you. All right. Um, Andy, you've been a little quiet. Do you have any lasting thoughts on this? Any other thoughts that you'd like to add? No pressure, just wanted to check. No, I think it's a good discussion, a good start, and it'll be interesting to see how the Finance Committee discussion next week, uh, what, where, where they take it after, since they were, the questions that prompted the PowerPoint came from the Finance Committee side, it'd be interesting, and then I'll report it back to you in some way. Be great. Yeah, and, and I actually was going to ask if um, Gilford and Amy, if it's possible for this uh, PowerPoint to be in our next packet. Um, Dorothy, if that's okay with you, it, this was really, that was helpful. Um, are there, thank you. Are there any other, oh, Shalini? Yeah, could, just last thing, could we get a sense of what the cost of insurance, if it was private or municipal, just for an average house property okay. value be? Yeah, Paul, I think you said you had a meeting coming up. Yep. Yeah, we, I don't know that number, but we'll get that for you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any, uh, Gilbert and Amy, are there any other decision points that you want to bring to us this evening? Otherwise, we can look at the actual re uh, regulation. Does that sound good? We can just look at the actual reg regulations if you'd like to, and then we can point out some of the, there's only, there's only some minor little tweaks we've made in the regulations. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I have them. I'm happy to pull them up on my screen unless, Athena, do you want me to do that or do you want to do it? Please go ahead. Oh boy, okay. It's a terrifying thought. All right. Yes, I should the right thing. Okay, so um, as we go through this really quickly, um, folks hopefully have read it and have questions and comments. Uh, I have just outlined the, the different areas. So starting <coughs> with um, section one, you're right, Dorothy? Yeah. Um, okay, good. So section one, this is just giving kind of the, the overview of what, uh, what we have to offer and um, how we support um, Belchertown, Hadley, Pelham, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I cannot see everyone at this point, so please uh, unmute and interrupt me if you have questions or comments, Gilford and Amy or Paul or anybody. So applicability, purpose, and policy. Um, this is who this serves and uh, why we need them. I'm not seeing any questions so far. Oh, Shani. Yeah, I'm just assuming that Amy or Gilford will uh, speak up when there's a change that's taking place. I hope so. Thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Um, Gilbert and Amy, I have the smallest little thing that's just me being really picky. Is there a reason why there's different fonts in this? No, that, that that's, I mean, partly that's probably just how I made this, but then I also oh. noticed that this has been reformatted from when I sent it. So it's probably just okay. a cop I will, not, I will not be picky. <laughs> All right. 
Um, so I think the, the part that I'm a little stuck on, um, so, so premises, right? So I think this is where it's, where we want to be really clear, uh, is premises property or buildings. And, and the reason I say that is because if we are defining something as going to the owner's premises, right, that's, is it the shutoff? Is it the property line? Um, am I, am I off base in that or, or would it? help us to clarify whether it's property or buildings. I, I think that's one of multiple places where if we make the decision to own either to the, you know, through the right of way or to the edge of the building, then that definition might need some clarity. There's going to be a lot of places. That's why we wanted to start with that conversation because that's going to trickle down through the water and sewer regs in general. So that makes a lot of sense. So thanks for flagging that though. Yeah, of course. Um, this is a little thing. This is more just it. Never mind. I'm going to ignore that. Uh, valve box cover. Question yeah, mark. we noticed that's missing the rest of it. I think that again, I think that was a cut and paste because that was in the original and this reformatted version. No I worries. Think somehow that got lost. Not to throw anyone under the bus, but um, <laughs> we'll give you that definition soon. <laughs> that sounds good. I was going to Google it, but you know. Um, all right, so standard conditions, this are, these are just kind of the general uh, general rules, so to say, for um, the, the utility, right? So the things that they abide by. Um, I did not have any questions on this part. Did anybody else? Okay. Um, water system components. So, um, oh, again, this was my question, right? And I, and I think, Amy, this is what you were just saying, right? Is what is a premises in that? In that instance, um, that's that's kind of the big decision maker right now. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. we don't know where that is, right? right? Right. So once we settle that, I think you're right. It'll totally trickle trickle down. Um, the uh, what's driving me nuts? Sorry. Oh, those different things. Okay. So the the um, there's a couple different. This is a question for you all about just, just kind of how water regs work. There's a couple different measurements for diameters, right? So there's there's two inches, there's three quarters of an inch, and then another place there's one inch. Are those the standard sizes? Does it make sense to just say two inches or, or do you really need the three? Like, is it realistic to say someone's gonna have all three of these potentially? No, one residence would, well, one residence may have two of these, but, and then a larger building may have one large line so it's uh but these three right here are the most common three we have okay a, a standard house like that's where you have the three quarter inch that's standard that goes into a standard residential house and then as you get into the larger buildings that's where they get the one inch or the two inch or possibly larger in some instances so okay thank you um all right no one is stopping me yet, so I'm just going to keep keep going. Uh, I did have a, a snarky comment about does it matter how they thaw the water service, <laughs> um, but I will I will let that go. I'm, I'm not going to have you specify. All right, so um, this is yeah. I had a question about this. I didn't understand insulation during winter months section about maintenance of the excavation within and outside the right of way until final paving is installed. I stared at it for a little while and still was unclear on what that meant. Could you just explain that to me really quickly? So during a winter, during a winter emergency, we, we make the people do a temporary patch and you have to, you're responsible for that temporary patch until you do the final patch in the, in the summer. Okay. Thank I mean, a good example of that was down on Main Street near Aspen Chase. That's where we had a water main break in the winter and it was a pretty good da dump you know, in your car for months throughout the winter because we couldn't do a good patch uh, there until mm -hmm. the spring. Okay. Um, Can I just stay on that for a second? It says within and outside the right of way. Yep. Yep. Is it so, that like everything? Yes. So maybe so we, go ahead, go for it. Well, we just, I mean, some, some places, if it starts eroding and the starts to erode from the water, water line work, 
it can affect other neighbors and so forth. So we want them, they're responsible for maintaining this until they get grass growing and the final patch in the roadway and any other repair they have to make to the infrastructure. So, so this is to maintain, to emphasize that it's not just in the public way, it's just not on private, it's both, it's all areas that they have to maintain. Yes. Good, got it. Um, so one of the things that I know Shalini and I have had, had um, emails about from some folks in our district are private contractors and um, whether those, that's not necessarily a, I am assuming that they need to be licensed. And what I meant to do is uh, go up and look if there was a definition on that. Um, because I, I believe the situation that we have have heard about was someone who's, whose contractor did not do a job that the town found satisfactory. And so how do you ensure that uh, the private contractor is, is acceptable and is there a way to do that before getting a bill and then being told you have to do it again? Amy, go. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that is in, is in here is um, the town does have construction standards and um, so contractors, we, we know that there's some contractors that don't do a, a good job or that they don't put things in that according to our standards. And so the, the contractors have to get the town standards on an annual basis and sign off that say that they're going to do it. And, um, you know, if they don't, you know, unfortunately, you know, you have to give every contractor one shot, but if they don't, you know, we, we have a, we have a naughty list um, that through this process, we can allow them, you know, like we basically can disallow them from pulling permits to protect other um, residential owners from being taken advantage from someone like that. Um, but but part of that is also part of also ensuring the quality is the contractor and, and the, the homeowner ensuring that the contractor has, you know, calls us for an inspection before they fill in the hole. Cause very often the contractor forgets fills in the hole and no one from the town gets a set of eyes. And that set of eyes is, you know, for the homeowner's protection to make sure that it's a, it's a quality job. And so, you know, part of that is, mm -hmm. um, supposed to be in our process and we encourage people to um, take advantage of that part of the process. Melanie? Yeah, just following up, do you, how would residents know that they're, they're supposed to call you? I mean, I, if I had a contract, I would just trust that they're going to do it. Yeah. And I wouldn't know that I'm supposed to. That's, that's one of the issues we have too, is that some some contractors won't say, yes, I need to get a permit from the town. Um, and we, some, most of the time, we will catch those people in the course of doing their work. And it's not a very big town. We're out doing other things. We'll yeah. drive by and see somebody working. And yeah. if it's a water crew, they might tell the engineering staff, hey, this is somebody working. Is that, we, did, we don't know there's a permit. Um, the sewer guys do it as well. Is there somebody with a permit to work here? Um, but we watch in town and we usually catch the people who don't pull a permit. Um, sometimes we don't, but the majority of the time we do. And we make them pull a permit and we stop and make sure everything's okay. Okay. And then what is the recourse that the resident might have in case the person didn't, the contractor did not do the job well? Um, unfortunately, the, it's just uh, between him and the contractor. So they may have to, get a lawyer and do the legal mm -hmm. issue with them. But if they had not conformed to the town thing, uh, town um, requirements, but you still staying, it, it would still be between the contractor and the homeowner. Okay. Yes, I mean, we may be brought into it to say, yes, they didn't meet the standards and so forth, but- I see. We, we have not, we've only had two really big issues with contractors since I've been here. And we've been able to work our way through those. Sonia, are you okay? Uh, Anika? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I was having um, trouble over here. Uh, so is there or could there be maybe a, a Q&A that's on the, the town sites in regards to water and sewer for people who may not know the answers to these questions? Yes, there, there can be. We have information on there now on the website. If people see, read it and think there needs to be more or they have questions, always send us a question and we can put more information on there. Um, we don't get much feedback about what we have on there. So I don't mm -hmm. think people really 
you know, we tell people to go to the website to find information out, but we don't get, uh, we haven't gotten much feedback, although I imagine tomorrow we're going to have a whole list of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No one gives you that idea. Uh, Do Anika, did that answer your question? Okay. Here, Dorothy? Um, rather than expect people to look up something on the website, which most people won't do or don't do, um, in the easy part of the website, the opening part, um, maybe you could be featured. Um, have some kind of interesting graphics and pictures and questions to try to um, grab people's attention when they're really casually browsing for just any old thing like, like what's, is there going to be a party on the green this weekend? Um, because I think few people are really going to go and check out your stuff. So, so we will, we will get Guilford on TikTok and then, um, no, I, I, I appreciate that, Dorothy. I think let's, um, I, I, I apologize. I just looked back at the agenda and Athena's probably like sending me emails right now saying, Hey, wrap it up. So, um, I think that I want to try to get through a couple more of these because I noticed we have a couple other things on our agenda. Dorothy, is that okay if I go in for another five minutes? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, da -da 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 -da. all right. Are we all set with, um, moving on to meters? Okay. So meters, um, just generally, like, this was kind of my other question really about the varying sizes, right? So if they, uh, the utility needs to prove it if it's over an inch, but then if it's over two inches, there's special coordination with the utility. And I just wanted to know how those are different. Special coordination versus uh, approval. I'll unmute myself. Sorry about that. Um, so this section is actually a little different and we've changed it from what it was before. Okay. And how we've changed it is, is we charge a meter rental fee in the bill and we've only been replacing meters up to two inches. But if you have a two inch meter or larger, we still charge you a rental fee. So with this, if you approve these regulations, we will take ownership of all meters at this time, including two inches <laughs> and higher. So we stock five eighths and th I mean the three quarters and the one inch meters in our shop. We do not stock a lot of two inches and larger. <laughs> so if you got a meter greater than two inches, you need to, we need to coordinate so we can get it ordered and brought in. And that's why that's in there right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, little quick thing, which was, I mean, superintendent of public works or their designee, or is it just, just you, Gilford? Um, it's my designee always. Okay. It's superintendent or our designee, yes. Okay, great. I'm going to keep moving unless someone stops me. I did not have a lot of comments in this area. Uh, I was unclear on what a private meter was, but that's me needing to Google, not you needing to teach me. Um, agricultural meters. Oh, so meter repairs. I This was another one where I was a little bit just confused. It seemed vague. Um, so Dorothy, why don't you start? I've been talking a lot. You're muted. This just reminds me, somebody was complaining to me about placement of meters up on historic houses and um, did not want the meter on the front of the house and was being told it had to be in the front of the house. So I'm just wondering what leeway. Oh, I see Amy looks like she Amy. Really so was, me, Meters are actually in the basement. Um, so they're oh. not in the front of the house. But I will say this, um, one of the things that we're making an active push on is replacing every single meter in town with the radio reads, which means you won't have to have that electrical socket size thing outside your house. So we would be glad to replace their meter with one that's a radio read if they just call our office. And anybody who doesn't have the newer style meter, we would love to replace it. We're trying to replace all of them in town. So thank you. Thank you for giving me the soapbox to stand on for a sec. That was great. Um, my question here is actually a lot simpler than I initially was, was worried, uh, was concerned about just who determines ordinary wear. Um, is that a standard that you're prepared to apply consistently? Yes, it is. I mean, if it, if it's, we have to come in and replace it because it froze and cracked open, we're going to charge you for it. Um, if it is old and just looks like it needs to be replaced and it's been there for five, to, well, it's been there for 10 to 15 years, we'll just probably replace it. Okay. And that's because I'm allowed to use a flamethrower to thaw my own products, according to these bylaws. 
Well, if you choose the other route, we'll be doing some of that thawing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right. Um, backflow prevention, hydrants. My only thing here was, um, oh no, I have two things. So again, what is a reasonable amount of time as determined by the utility, right? So is is that so variant based on, on the issue that you wanted to leave it vague or? Um, it, it, it can be it can be very um, okay. it can be very different depending on the situation. Um, we have some places that have multiple meters in the properties, and if you have multiple meters and you only or multiple hydrants, and you only have one hydrant out. Um, we're okay with it taking a little longer to replace the hydrant. Um, we're also okay with waiting until the spring or summer. If you only have one hydrant and the fire department says and they feel and we feel you really need to get it fixed. We'll make you fix it right away. Um, so it, it does depend on the property and what's going on there. Um, okay, so, oh, this was my last thing was uh, unauthorized use of a fire hydrant may result in a fine being levied against the perpetrator. So just quickly, uh, you call them fire hydrants, some places just hydrants and others. I wasn't sure if that mattered. Um, but then the other part is uh, the perpetrator. What if it's a kid? Like, what, you know, is it, is it, property owner, if it what, a minor, what I should say, how do you um, levy a fine against a perpetrator? And what is that fine? Is that outlined below? I apologize if I missed it. In the um, we actually, we might have to look at what the fine actually is. Um, most of the time, the people we find, the people we find tampering with hydrants are contractors, um, people trying to get water for something they're doing in town and they just come and they tap into a hydrant. You, you have to have you have to be pretty knowledgeable how a hydrant works to get it to go. Um, there are probably some young adults in Amherst who know how to do it and can probably figure it out. Um, we would just shut those off and tell them to leave them alone. But we do have from time to time had contractors just open our hydrants, connect things to it, actually cause a cross connection at times and then put the public at risk. Um, and those are the ones that we actually go after the most and we actually put on our, our bad person list. Can you explain what a cross connection is, Guilford? So a cross connection is when, <clears throat> when you take water out of the system, you want it to be pure and clean. Um, if you actually allow a hose from your system to dip into a swimming pool, there's a possibility that you, that hose will suck the swimming pool water back into your system and then you can end up drinking that water in your house. So those are the most common cross connections is some type of hose going from water that's not potable water into your potable water system. It, a, a big example of this happened. I, it was somewhere in Eastern Mass and it was several years ago, but it was a landscaping contractor who hooked their landscaping truck up to a hydrant illegally and they were filling up their tank to go um, you know, water someone's lawn, but it, um, but it had, yeah, it had fertilizer in it. And what happened is they were like one hydrant away from a um, nursing home that happened to turn on a couple of washing machines and it caused negative pressure. And so it caused water to instead be, instead of flowing into that tank of that contractor, it flowed into the system. And so the entire system, the entire water system in that community had to get drained to get the um, fertilizer out of the water. Um, and so that's the critical nature of what we're talking about here is, um, you know, it's, it, we're not saying that you can't use it just because whatever, it's because we're, we're trying to keep the water safe because people drink it. Oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, I would appreciate, I think, clarification on, on the, the fines, um, what those are and making sure that those are, are approved um, clearly. All right, so I'm going to pause here just because it's 816 and, and we've got some other things to do. I would love to ask my fellow committee members if it's possible for the next time that we look at water regs to, if you have questions, um, let me know like which sections they're in ahead of time, if you know. Um, so that we can, I can go through this uh, quickly and efficiently. Um, and then similar for, for sewer, because I'm sure we will have questions in sewer as well. Um, and yeah, Shalini. Yeah, since uh, the staff is most in touch with the residents and what are their concerns, um, I wonder if uh, you all could speak to, I'm sure you are already doing that, but just in case you aren't, 
what are the common issues that are or complaints that we're hearing from residents with respect to water and sewer? Uh, well, the, the biggest ones we've been having recently is actually because of COVID. And it's not worried about COVID in the water. It's the fact mm -hmm. that our student population has gone up and down so drastically at different times of the year that is not normal. Um, we've had times where the water quality has changed quite a bit from normal. Um, we've had people in the center of town who are getting a little higher chlorine than they don't usually got, and it's throwing them off a little bit. Um, so th those are the those are probably the biggest things that have been going on. Since the students have come back, though, right now um, things have settled down and it's much much calmer and I imagine this summer will be like a normal summer it won't be it won't be well I don't know I mean last summer we actually had really low flows because we had so many restaurants that were mm. closed on yeah. Sunday Monday I think Tuesday and Wednesday it only opened Thursday Friday Saturday yeah. um, and that changed our flow in the system and caused different characteristics and water quality issues throughout the system which is interesting. Mm. Dorothy? Um, I remember a few years ago, and this is before I got involved in town politics, that I would get robocalls saying that the water quality was bad. Uh, I, maybe before Paul's time, I'm not sure. But there was a, you know, like a, a period of time when we got a lot of those calls. Um, what was the problem then and why are we not having those calls now? What did you do to fix it? We stopped doing robocalls. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> no, I can I can talk about that a little bit. So the 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 last time that happened, it was actually I want to say it was like 2015 or 2016 in the summer. And it was one of those summers that was really hot. And because it was so warm, there was um, we, we had some bacteria hits in our system. And so when you get a bacteria hit, we're required to do public notification to let everyone know. Um, and so that was, that was something that, um, you know, we had to let you guys know that there was, um, there was a problem with the water. That's why you guys got all those. Um, I will say that much as we got a couple of bacteria hits, I remember calling the DEP in that time and they were like, what, you only have two in your system. We've got bigger problems to deal with because that summer it was so warm that everyone was having these problems. It was really hard to keep the water, um, clean and safe. And obviously that's, that's the goal. Okay, thank you. So um, everyone's homework is to come prepared with your questions about sewer and any other questions you have about water for next next session. And then um, Amy and Guilford, are you uh, planning on doing the same sort of thing, talking about the decision points for for sewer? That that was, it, I mean, they're kind of the similar, kind of similar, right? It's the yeah, same. same the big the, okay. Yes. So we will all mull that um, for the next, I think it's two weeks. Um, and and then Paul will update us on the fees and we will also hear, this is this is a separate referral to finance, Andy. So it's not a recommendation, right? Or was it a recommendation from finance to us? I can't remember. I'm not sure that I can remember either. Uh, though I think that uh, our focus is gonna be somewhat on the fee side and the cost side. I won't get into it in great detail. It was an interesting article in the Gazette earlier this week about Northampton's rates. And uh, they have, um, there are some different rate structures and we're gonna be talking about that, but I think that um, is a practical matter um, and I've had communications with the finance director about this, that uh, those conversations really can't um, hold up the uh, work on the regulations. And so we could possibly get at the rate questions later um, and uh, come back and look at it as an amendment to um, what we otherwise are adopting now rather than try and do it all at a single time because otherwise uh, we're holding up the regulations while waiting for the rates and i think that and we definitely have made a decision to not try and do the rates for fy23 the earliest it's going to be as fy24 
So I don't know if that makes sense or if there's any questions on that. I have a, I have a follow-up. So does that mean, because what we were talking about earlier has major rate implications. So is that, can we make that decision yeah. with regards to the regulation in terms of going to the property line without talking about the rates? It, I think so, because I think that what we were talking, what you're talking about, we will talk about too, which yeah. is just the issue that you described. Mm -hmm. But the other things are uh, whether there are different rate structures, like in Northampton, they do it based upon um, a variable rate that depends upon the size of the um, domain coming into the property. And uh, so a smaller diameter has a, has a lower rate. And um, there are various other ways that Amy's talked with us about in a previous meeting. Um, and uh, it's a question of whether we want to uh, move towards a rate structure that is uh, uh, sort of encourages conservation. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Amy explained to us last year when we, she met with the Finance Committee about um, the state really encouraging that um, practice. She can say whatever, you know, she might add to it now. But um, if we do those kinds of major, there's a section towards the end of the proposed regulations where uh, you might do some changes to how we approach the rate, but I think we want to do that carefully and we don't necessarily want to hold up the regulations to get at that one section. I see, I'm going to let Amy respond and then Dorothy will go to you and then I'm, I'll probably turn the meeting back over to you, Dorothy. So Amy? Yeah, and I more just wanted to clarify what Andy was saying is that the discussion of ownership, basically what that's gonna do is affect the budget, how much right. money we have to collectively collect between all the water and sewer users. And what we're talking about in the finance committee, some of those decisions is how that's divvied up between different user types. So they're related, but separate, if that makes sense. Thank you. Dorothy? Um, just as in uh, with the water system, they're thinking of uh, linking the rate structure to encourage conservation with the sewer structure. There is, you want to have some, some a move towards responsibility. Um, and those wipes really are something over which the homeowner has control and grease and down the drain, the homeowner has control. So we have to figure out how we can keep the, the responsibility on the sewer and, and uh, conservation on the water, I think, to have it be equitable system. Yeah. Shalini? Yeah, uh, uh, Andy raised a really good point, and that makes me think, do we want to then get ECAC's comments on these, how, if there are ways to um, bring in efficiencies or incentivize efficiencies because I do see in our neighborhood water just even if it's raining there's like water in the lawns being used or you know things like that I don't know if that gets covered in this bylaw or somewhere else okay no I was just going to comment on that particular point is that one of the things in this bylaw is um, rain gauges for um, for irrigation systems for that specific point. Um, and that's something that the state, again, is, is recommending highly is that's an easy thing to conserve, conserve water by not watering when it's raining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. right. Um, and and Shali, ECAC does know that we are discussing this. Uh, I brought it to their meeting last week uh, or this week, sorry. Um, they're focusing right now on some of the other things that are in CRC, but um, if, I will I will revisit that with them to to see if they have a comment. Thank you. Um, okay, so I want to I had really lofty hopes of getting all the way through that regulation. So I'm I'm you know it is what it is. But uh, Gilbert and Amy, thank you so much. It sounds like Dorothy, just to confirm with you as chair, uh, we will finish. We will we will get through the regulations next week um, and and potentially come to a decision and launch into sewer, which should go a little bit faster. Um, 
not necessarily faster, but because we've already had the, the bulk of the decision. Right. Um, and by our next meeting, we will also have information from Paul regarding the cost for private versus utility owned uh, or held insurance. Is that correct? To sum up? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if we'll have the actual numbers for you, but we'll try. You have ball, okay, or an idea, or an update on the conversation. Okay. All well, right, Dor uh, Guilford and Amy, thank you so, so much for yes. spending your Thursday evening. We totally appreciate it. And thank you, Anna, for running a very tight meeting. We all appreciate it. Um, we have, um, it is uh, five minutes to 8.30, which is supposed to be our witching hour, but we have a few things to do. Um, first of all, are there any announcements? Okay, seeing none. Um, we're gonna have, do next agenda preview and we have to um, approve the minutes. So let's approve the minutes first. Are there any questions on the March 24th, 2022 regular meeting minutes? Okay, can I entertain somebody offer a motion to accept the um, minutes? I move we approve the minutes of March, oh shoot. 24. Thank you, March 24th, 2022. Great. Thank I'll you second. Very, thank you very much. Okay, so I'll call the roll. Uh, Shalini. Yes. Yes, Dorothy, yes. Um, Anika. Yes. Anna. Yes. And Andy. Yes. Okay, so the minutes have been accepted unanimously. Um, on the next agenda preview, um, we have had a request that we um, discuss um, some of the issues to do with senior services as they're presently provided. Um, we have also a carryover that we thought we were gonna discuss of, of speed limits. Um, and there's a TAC memo um, I believe, well, what we already have down. Okay, we have the Kendrick Park parking public hearing. Okay, so I would think at that time, um, there was a TAC memo about the new crosswalk proposed across from Garcia's, which is the other side of Kendrick Park. I think it would make sense to um, have a, a brief discussion of that too, if we could. Uh, I think we're gonna get a presentation on the roads overview. Um, and uh, there may be some, um, town manager appointments. Um, to that, I would like to add the senior services and the discussion of the speed limit. Um, are there any problems with that? Um, and I'll ask you, Paul. Um, yeah, well, it's a whole lot. And also, I'm not sure when you're gonna bring up water and sewer regulations again. Uh, that's a night when you will have the town engineer plus Guilford here. Okay. Um, I think if you're, that's just a lot. I think the roads in and of itself is a solid hour because there's a presentation to be made, uh, an ex explanation on how we rate roads and you'll have a lot of questions, I think about it. So, uh, because it's a hot topic for folks right now, especially with pothole season as Guilford mentioned, um, I, I think it's a really heavily loaded agenda. You won't get out in two, yeah, two hours if that's what you want to put on the agenda. Um, well, we have to have, I believe we have to have the Kendrick Park hearing, public hearing. Because I mean, I didn't put that on, so I assume it's on the, the calendar that it has to be then, um, but I don't know. Um, Athena has her hand up. Okay, uh, I, I don't know whose hand that is. Athena. Oh, Athena, okay, I, I see you. Okay, Athena, you're just a ghost right there. Athena, yes. I am a ghost. Um, <laughs> we do need to publish notice of the public hearing before we can schedule it. So I was hoping that the committee would discuss what date they'd like to have the hearing and that that date would be far enough into the future that we can um, okay. review so, the, the meeting notice that needs to be published in the newspaper. Okay, so that's that's good. So we don't have to hold the public hearing. We just have to set the date. And what I don't know is what requirements are linked to that hearing. Um, I mean, does what it do have you mean requirements? Well, is it part of something that's having taking place right now that we have to do right away? Or can we say we'll put it off for two or three meetings? That's what I don't know. Um, I think there is, Athena, correct me if I'm wrong, that there is a time limit once we referred it to, like once, because it was open, or it was introduced oh, at council. Yes. And so the, does the hearing need to happen within a certain number of days of the referral? I'm just checking. Yeah. 
Uh, yes. Checking. And Andy, did you want to speak while she's checking? I think they yes. wanted, the, the council wanted um, a report back, a recommendation report by May 16th. Yeah, Athena, do you remember whether it was a report or a recommendation? The motion was to refer the proposed changes to North Pleasant Street for public hearing on recommendations to be provided by the town manager related to changes um, on parking and a recommendation to the town council by May 16. So I think that part of the discussion on Monday was that the town manager was going to present the committee with a proposal for the parking fees and, and rates and so on for those new spaces. And that then, because in the notice for the public hearing on parking, we need to include what exactly it is we're having the hearing on. And right now we don't have proposed rates and fees and times and so on. So we need those before we can um, draft those into the hearing notice. Okay, the now, reason I was raising the question is, uh, and I'm interrupting now, is that, uh, of course, I was appointed to be our liaison to the, uh, from the council to TAC, and TAC meets uh, on Thursday evenings, too, so I was, I was at the TAC meeting immediately prior to this meeting. And this was a substantial discussion at the tech meeting because they are uncertain about what our expectations are for their uh, participation in the discussion that will follow the parking. So um, I really urge that um, some thought be given to what happens after the hearing and whether we are referring then from TSO and asking for tech DAAC to give um, any um, feedback before we um, have any recommendation that TSO is making to the council. Um, so um, we frequently ask those two committees and um, they were kind of leaning on me for an answer and I didn't have an answer, of course. Um, so I'm just instead uh, reporting that part of the today's uh, TAC meeting to you. So Andy, I just want to clarify. I thought this was Kendrick Park parking. I thought this was, well, I, I know that in talking to Tracy Zathian, that there's a feeling that the park is being well used now. It's going to be used more and more as the weather turns good and that they wanted to do a few changes right now that weren't going to cost money or at least cost very, very little, which would be one way traffic and moving the parking from the west side to the east side and keeping it parallel parking. In other words, not the big thing to come, but just an interim thing which TAC thinks is safer for people using the park. Um, that doesn't involve rates and fees as far as I know. So um, I, I need some clarification on what this public hearing is on okay um paul can i call for you? yeah so i think what the council voted on what athena reported on the council vote on monday was that um to that i'm supposed to give you a recommendation on what you want to have on the on the agenda that's not going to happen in time for a public hearing on the 21st so maybe we should plan on having the public hearing on kendrick park parking on may 5th i think that's the meeting afterwards and that gives us time to put it Put it together unless Athena, we have to bring the actual notice back to this committee, which might hurt the uh, the timing of it. If I may, Dorothy, the committees yes. haven't done that in the past before. Usually, it's the chair's discretion to yeah. draft the public hearing notice. We would use roughly the same format that we used last time. Yeah, but it would include the specific um, spaces that were being considered for the public hearing, and but the rates. And so, on. so if I can continue, so maybe we look at April 21st for the roads overview. Um, if you, since you, I, I would say, since you have water and sewer, continue, finish up your job on the water and sewer and go, I will have appointments for you. Um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to get senior. I'm not sure what you'll be responding to in terms of senior, if that's just an open discussion or how you want to have that. Um, or else, and then the May 5th, we would have the public hearing on Kendrick Park. 
Um, um, okay, I would like to have a, a very time limited discussion, just a preliminary discussion on some of the senior issues where we're not going to solve anything or do whatever, but just a beginning discussion of it that um, maybe 15 minutes. I think we could, could do that. But um, again, I will hear from other people on the committee. Um, Athena has a hand up. Okay, Athena and Anna, Anna has her hand up too. Okay, Athena, please go ahead. Just a reminder that we still have the outreach update from CPOs that we had planned for the uh, next meeting. Yes. We also have the residential rental property fees that we um, didn't finish up with tonight. So um, just looking at the next couple of agendas. Right, right. There's, there's some things that would need to be finished up first. So I'm just okay. Um, wanted to make you aware that, that um, I would assume that you would carry those onto the next agenda. Yes. Okay. Um, um, Anna, uh, you're coming. Yeah, that, that's similar to what I was going to say is um, the, the, those pesky rental registration fees and then the um, water and sewer would be great. The, the little, the taskmaster in me is like, oh my God, I want to check that box so bad. Um, but I think the other thing, Dorothy, is I wonder, uh, I really, I really appreciate the, the concerns about the seniors. And I'm wondering if it makes sense to bring that forward more as a council work session versus um, a TSO priority, because we haven't, unless I'm mistaken, when we talked about our priorities for TSO, um, we didn't, one, we, I don't know if we totally kind of solved that list, but um, I want to leave space for things that come forward, but I also, mm -hmm. Is it, is it possible that this would make more sense as a work session or a public dialogue um, on the council level? And I don't, I'm not sure the answer to that, but uh, I just, I wonder if, if it comes straight to TSO or if it should go through council first or what mm -hmm. um, that process is. But I, um, I agree that honestly, the next meeting is gonna be so full with um, finishing sewer water and doing the regulations and then also roads. Because the other thing that we haven't talked about is the proposed changes to our charge. Um, and that needs to get, cause we didn't get to it today. And so um, I know that there's, that's kind of hanging up some other potential actions as well mm. that I know relate to what some folks on this committee are really passionate about um, in terms of outreach. So uh, it, it, it'd be helpful to kind of do a little bit of um, mm. Tetris. All right, uh, I think I saw Anika's hand before Andy's, but um, maybe the picture- So go with Anika. Okay, Anika. Okay. Uh, no, I just wanted to remind us that, um, you know, senior services were on our list um, as we, you know, when we uh, started here. However, you know, we are guided by the issues that are come, that come up and that we have to attend to within our next session. So I, I do think that um, whether it is a, a council session or uh, further on in the future, on the agenda that we should find some time for it. Thank you, thank you. Um, Andy. Yeah, I was gonna say something similar to what Nika just said. We've got, we need to be very careful not to get too many things opened at the same time and then not be able to close them or we'll get ourselves uh, just in a really confused state. Uh, and we do have some things that um, were thrown at us, like the, uh, um, for the next stage of the North Pleasant Street is an obvious one. Um, I think for the um, senior center, the most important thing to do is to assure them that they've been heard and to give them a date or at least a time frame when we will be spending some time with them but I don't think that it necessarily needs to be our next meeting. In the speed limit, I agree with Paul, having been through the discussion in the first year of the first council, um, that is a substantial discussion. And uh, it is not one that's worth opening up unless we're gonna spend some, some big time at it, because I suspect that if the word gets out that we are taking that issue up, we're going to get lots of people from lots of different neighborhoods who are going to have opinions to express about it. It's going to be one that we're going to be hearing about, which is important, but we have to be sensitive to the amount of time that it's going to take to enable people mm -hmm. to speak to us. Okay. And Shalini. 
Yeah, I, I would agree that we don't have to do the senior um, uh, center services right away, but I think it's in, <clears throat> it was in our list of priorities, and that is why it is important to have some kind of um, way in which we are prioritizing our priorities. I still feel like we're kind of just taking things as they're coming, but mm -hmm. also to have some sort of... Um, process by which we are prioritizing and ordering certain things. Some things are coming because we have to do them uh, mm -hmm. from the town staff, but then there are other things that come to us. And I think that's where we have uh, a say and what is our process for prioritizing that. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that discussion, but that being said, I do agree that uh, let's decide on a time. It doesn't have to be given mm -hmm. the agenda we have. We could maybe make it in the next, um, the third meeting, because it seems like the next two are gonna be pretty full. But, and that would give them time, just as long as we're giving them a committed time. Right, okay. Um, I feel that we need to let the seniors know that they have been heard and that we want to listen to do more. I also agree that we don't have any quick ideas. So my suggestion is that, um, and Paul, you can correct me on this. Can we do that three meetings from now? Yes. So I think what you have, a, as Shalini says, sort of discretionary items. One is, is the senior, mm -hmm. one is the speed limits, one is the roads, one is outreach, and one is your charge. So I think, um, Dorothy, maybe next time we meet to set the agendas, we can sort of plot those out over the next three or four meetings of the TSO committee and you can sort of make some right figure out how you want how do you want to prior prioritizing means you're not going to do something else so we, we we all want to prioritize seniors or roads or or the charge or whatever but that means whichever one you prioritize the other one is not going to happen so again the committee just should decide which ones you want to take on first I wholly agree that you should be cleaning up and finishing up topics before you take on significant new ones right so okay um, and um, I think in answer to Shalini, um, yes, I think we need a work session, but I, I have a question. Can a committee refer something to the town council? In other words, if we had a brief discussion, can we then make a referral and say, we want the town council to discuss this? Or is it always from the town council to the committee? And at Athena, um, it would be it would be appropriate to make a recommendation to the town council to to do something. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted us to be alert and to be thinking. Uh, we're a creative group, and people get ideas, and we we're going to have to be creative right now because we don't we are having a space crunch. We have a lot of things that we're doing at once. Um, okay. Um, I think that that's all that we've done need to do it's quarter of nine and i believe this is when we adjourned our meeting last time um not too too bad um is there anyone who has something to say before we hear a motion to adjourn okay do i hear a motion i move we adjourn at 8 45 p.m okay and a second second very good okay <laughs> Uh, and I, that's too fast for me to keep notes on. So <laughs> thank you, folks. Thank you all for the good work. And uh, I think we had a good meeting. Paul, did you have a comment there? You just need to vote. Ah, we need to vote. Thank you. Right. Okay. Uh, Pam, yes. Um, Lopes. <laughs> yes. Gautier. Val Milne. Yes. And Steinberg. Yes. Okay, great. We are adjourned. Wonderful. Good night, everybody. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you.